great credit is one of the most important factors when it comes to leveraging other people's money and creating wealth while also getting the best terms when we do that. So what is actually considered to be great credit when you're out looking for debt weapons? Now, most credit scores, including the two most commonly used FICO and Vantage Score 3.0, use a range of between 300 all the way to 850, and a score of 700 and up is typically considered good credit. Now, within that range, there are different categories from bad to excellent, and they generally look a little like this. Excellent credit is most often defined as a 750 and better, whereas good credit is somewhere between the 700 to 749 range, fair credit between 650 and 699, poor credit between 600 to 649, and then last and certainly least, bad credit, which is below 600. Now, as you dig through our videos here on the VIP Financial Ed YouTube channel, you're gonna see that we're always recommending targeting a 760 and up. And even though we've told you often that a 740 and better will almost always help you become and remain eligible for the best interest rates and the best terms and the best insurance policies, uh, the reason that you're going to want to continue to work for a 760 or even an 800 or better is to build room for natural fluctuation that happens when you're out applying for different loans. Now, remember, lenders all have their own guidelines of what they consider to be a good credit score. Uh, a lender that's looking to approve more borrowers, for instance, might approve applicants with credit scores of a 680 or higher, whereas other lenders might offer a similar type of a loan product, but be more strict and only approve scores of a 700 or higher. There might be a third lender that offers credit to anyone with a score of at least a 680, but charges a higher interest rate and fees. So the key will always boil down to asking the right questions ahead of time. Now, I'm always curious, and you may be too, about how you rate. All borrowers should aspire to have great credit. After all, great credit is one of the most important factors when it comes to leveraging other people's money and creating wealth, while also getting the best terms when we do that. Trying to narrow down a specific number that can represent good credit can be a little difficult. After all, there are many different credit scores that are used by lenders when underwriting a loan application. And what one lender might view as good credit may fall into another lender's fair credit rating. Not to mention that you likely score differently from one model to the next, which is an important piece to today's episode. Now, the good news is that there are broad rules of thumb that we can all follow that'll help you figure out whether or not your credit scores are good or not. So let's go ahead and break that down. Let's start with FICO. What is a FICO score? You have a FICO score for each of the three bureaus, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. And each of these scores is going to be based on different information that teaches the bureaus uh, about you and your patterns. This available data may very well differ from one bureau to the next. They are not required to report to all three bureaus throughout the year. One trade line or one creditor may report to just one or two of the bureaus and not all three. So it will begin, begin to be different between bureaus over time. The Fair Isaac Corporation was the creator of the FICO credit algorithm. And subsequently, these are the scores that supposedly are used by over 90% of lenders when it comes to providing you with a loan. And when they grant the interest rates and terms and decide whether or not you're approved, most of the time FICO is what they're, what they're gonna be reviewing. All the data contained in consumer credit reports is basically analyzed by this algorithm, and it's basically identifying these patterns over time, and the resulting FICO credit score is solely determined by what is found within a person's credit individual credit file. The information helps estimate the level of future risk. It's gonna give a lender an idea as to how likely you are to repay your loan, and whether or not they should offer you this product or any other form of credit for that matter. Now, because the FICO credit score can only be determined by information that's found inside a credit file, it's essential to look over your credit reports every single year. You're actually gonna be trying to find inaccuracies or discrepancies in order to ensure that everything is what it should be and up to date. Now, what I want you to do is check the description below for a link to creditkarma.com. Uh, this is not some form of paid sponsorship. We just 
rely on Credit Karma regularly for our own credit reports and data. So check that out. It's a completely free resource and you are entitled to one credit report and file from each of the bureaus every 12 months anyway. So you could reach out to Experian or Equifax or TransUnion and request your own personal credit file every 12 months. Today, that's much easier to do through other resources and do so far more regularly than once per year. Let's talk quickly about the Vantage scoring model. A Vantage score is actually a credit scoring model that emerged over a decade ago. And I remember it coming onto the scene, very strange to suddenly see all of these other credit scoring algorithms appear. Uh, it was actually a joint venture at the time between Experian, TransUnion, and Equifax. The Vantage score was designed to compete with Fair Isaac's FICO credit scoring model, interestingly enough. Now, when determining if you're a good candidate, a lender is gonna look at your credit scores. And most lenders, as I'd said earlier, use FICO credit scores for that. But some lenders are actually starting to look at Vantage scores as well in order to further determine you know, future financial risks, your likelihood of repayment, et cetera, and whether or not they should actually provide you an offer for any of their products. Uh, so be conscious of both. Both of these credit scoring formulas use very much of the same information. So things like payment history, things like uh, the type of credit you have, things like recent inquiries and new accounts, the overall age of your file, the, the amount you've borrowed compared to uh, what's available to you, so your utilization ratio. However, if the length of your credit history is not lengthy, meaning that you don't have at least six months worth of history, you may be required to monitor through Vantage Score because FICO will actually require a minimum of six months to even create a score for you, as well as a minimum of one reported account within the last six months. So if you've had a credit reporting history that's gone stale, you can actually lose your scores with FICO. So let's talk really quickly about the actual different range scales that exist. We're asked regularly in our comments section about this. There are many different types of credit scores that are available to different lenders. They each develop their own credit scoring range. Now, why is that important to you? Well, because if you get your credit score, you need to know the credit scoring range that you're looking at in order to understand where your number fits in. Here are the credit scoring ranges that are used by major credit scoring models. The first is, of course, FICO. We mentioned that that's a 300 to 850 range, as is the Vantage Score 3.0. Vantage Score scale version one and two, however, is just 501 to 990, whereas Experian's Plus Score, as it's called, is a 330 up to an 830, very strange. You've also got TransUnion scoring model called the New Account Score 2.0, which is a 300 starting point up to that standard 850. And of course, Equifax has their own scoring model going from just 280 up to that 850 mark too. So it can be very confusing. And with all the scores, the higher the number, of course, then the lower the risk. With that being said, consumers with higher scores are more likely to be approved for um, you know credit they're applying for, whereas people with lower scores are gonna be less likely. Additionally, they also tend to get the best terms, the best interest rates, the best insurance premiums. As we'd mentioned, insurance looks at credit too. So very, very, very important to your bottom line cash flow to be conscious of your credit. If your FICO score is an 840, for instance, uh, you're just 10 points away from having perfect credit, that, that elusive 850 score that we recently talked about. Whereas if you have the eight, you know, an 840 with a, a Vantage score 2.0, uh, it's not as impressive because you know, you're a, a 150 points away from a perfect credit score. So make sure you understand what your scores are. Don't just assume your scores are good because you've paid your bills on time or you don't have any collection accounts that you're aware of. The only way to know whether or not you have great credit is to check. And as I'd said, creditkarma.com tends to be the best place for you to get access to the Vantage Score 3.0 model. Now, while that is different than FICO, if you have terrific Vantage Score uh, 3.0 credit scores, chances are you're gonna have at least good or even great FICO credit scores, if not excellent there as well, which means it's not worth it to go out and spend any money getting access to these accounts. The key is preservation of income. The key is how much money can you have left over at the end of each month? That is your leftover net cash flow position, which is going to determine your ability to make more choices and have more options. So cash flow is king, meaning don't spend money unnecessarily on credit scores you don't need. Well, I'm curious to know 
What is the credit scoring mechanism that you use to track your credit scores most often? Are you using Credit Karma as well or are you using another site? There are a lot of them still right now, more and more seemingly coming out all the time. So I'm curious to know where you're getting your credit scores. Have you noticed a difference in the ranges? Have you noticed a difference between the different bureaus? Uh, very interested to see what you guys uh, have experienced on your, uh, on your uh, research as well. Until we see you on the next video, thank you so much for checking us out. We'll see you next time. Until then, make it a great day and take care. All right, so I realize that some of you have not gotten one of the single most popular budgeting tools available, not to mention it's free, and that is called the Cash Flow Cruncher. So what I wanna to do today is walk you through the process of downloading your very own copy. It comes in the form of an Excel spreadsheet, so it's very easy to use and uh, it's quick to navigate. So let's go ahead and walk through that process together. The first thing you'll do is in the search menu, you'll go to cashflowcruncher.com, which will take you to the download page. Simply type your email address into the field to claim your free copy and go ahead and select the red button. Immediately, it'll pull up the download button, which will open a new Cashflow Cruncher spreadsheet. Now you can see I've already got a copy open and enlarged here for you to see. The first page it'll open is the cash flow summary tab, which is a non-editable page. It's very important to understand that this opening tab is, uh, will not require you to put any information into these fields. This actually imports the data from the other tabs below. Now, if you've ever used an Excel spreadsheet, you'll navigate the spreadsheet by going to individual pages down here and it'll start with the revenue and assets page. On this page, you'll wanna itemize each individual income that you bring into the household or the business. Now, it's always been my recommendation that you create an individual cash flow cruncher for your businesses, an individual cash flow cruncher for your real estate, and an individual cash flow cruncher for your household.